Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Erin Schneider. I work with the North Central Fair Program and I also farm. And I am really excited to be here with uh, Marie Flanagan. Hello. You're in for a treat. We are here with John Jamerson from Legacy Taste of the Garden. And that is right outside of or in Lyle Station, Indiana. And as with like all of our Farming Matters episodes, we're really here to help um, just celebrate your completion of your grant. You can tell us a little about your SARE project, but then also just like, you know, you were mentioning like really interesting directions that yeah, that your farm has been taking and and you you all have staying power I with what fifth generation, sixth generation farm. And I will just toss it over to you, John, and you can share what you're all about and um, where you're growing from here. And just thank you so much. Well, thank you guys for having me. I definitely appreciate it. Uh, the opportunity to be a part of this grant. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was the first grant that I wrote and the first one that I was granted. So uh, it, it's, it was a very uh, steep learning curve for me. Uh, and it's something that I would uh, suggest that everybody take a part of. Uh, I had a very great opportunity with it. So I want to thank you guys for uh, uh, having me here. The name of our grant was uh, the Legacy United Farmers and Community uh, and, and Urban Food Desert uh, Project. And it was uh, part of the SARE grant in 2019. Uh, the name of our business is uh, Legacy Taste of the Garden. We're located uh, in uh, Lyle Station, but the address is in Princeton, Indiana. Uh, we are fifth and sixth generation of farming. Uh, our Logo, our motto is to create, maintain, pass down, and continue. This is my father-in-law, Norman Greer, who is uh, featured in the Smithsonian African American Museum of History and Culture. He's in there as one of the last remaining African American farmers who still farm in family on land that they own pre-Civil War. Uh, at Legacy uh, Taste of the Garden, uh, like I said, we are a family uh, farm that uh, has uh, that started back in 1855. Uh, since we've started this grant, we've uh, obtained a couple more grants. Uh, one is the 2501 grant, uh, which is part of the LIFE project. Uh, and we re-upped that one again this past year in 2022 uh, to get that a second time. Um, as a legacy Taste of the Garden, our project. Some of our objectives were to utilize uh, the website and social media to connect farmers and communities uh, and share information, products, and locations to provide locally fresh produce and increase consumption in the communities designated as food deserts, to educate the communities and youth in different farming techniques that can be utilized in urban farms and garden and to educate communities and youth in nutritional values of eating whole foods and, and the health benefits, and to encourage the community and the youth to participate in CSA diet and health challenges. So part of our objective uh, was to, to begin to educate uh, the communities and the youth in different farming techniques. Uh, we took them from seed to, uh, to market. Uh, we taught the different uh, styles of uh, uh, how they could farm and grow from raised beds to hoop house uh, to aquaponics. Uh, we introduced them to uh, a wide world of agriculture, everything from rodeos to markets. Uh, in the right corner there is a group of bus that we took from Evansville to uh, Atlanta uh, so that they could see urban farming in the uh, in other areas, so that they could understand that this wasn't just something that we were just making up, but this was something that was becoming a trend across the nation. Uh, we taught them different types of garden styles. Uh, we had uh, different festivals and stuff that we were a part of. Uh, on the right is a bucket style of uh, drip irrigation uh, that they that we taught that they could grow, uh, and that was in Indianapolis. Uh, the importance of, of teaching the different styles and techniques were to uh, teach them that there were more than one way to grow, not to get stuck on traditional farming, not to get stuck on uh, 
uh, raised beds, but to let them know that challenges were going to come as far as, as uh, growing food and to use their mind and imagination on creating different ways to do such. And so um, these are some of the different growing techniques that we have here. Uh, part of our objective was to educate the community and the youth uh, in eating uh, uh, nutritional uh, foods and whole foods as the health benefits. Uh, here we are at several different markets uh, in Evansville and Indianapolis. Um, and so the communities that we, we serve was Princeton, Evansville, and Indianapolis. Um, and so we would bring the fresh products, produce to these communities and, and uh, make sure that we had to educate the people on that. Um, on the right, we have a, a bunch of youth that were a part of our garden program. Uh, we try to make sure that they understood what they were growing, the difference between the different types of the tomatoes and cucumbers and things of that nature so that they could educate the community when they went to sell it. Uh, in our youth groups, we had uh, 4-H uh, participation. Uh, one of our uh, individuals down below in the lower right corner uh, had won a grand champion for the county for her cucumber. Uh, and we taught them and we make sure that they, as I said before, were very well educated and, and took pride in what they were doing. Uh, we had them to do uh, different types of participations uh, and presentations to uh, uh, teach them how to can, uh, teach them how to, uh, the importance of value added. Uh, and we also did what was called a book and cook uh, program where we partnered with uh, other organizations in the community and uh, uh, our book and cook uh, project with uh, uh, the uh, African American Museum in Evansville uh, was granted an, an award as the Regional Collaboration Project Award in 2021. Um, we also did CSA bags and taught people how to uh, to grow. We promoted local uh, products and stuff in our CSA bags. We brought the local produce that we had, uh, as well as other things, and this mostly came, uh, really grew through COVID when people weren't able to go to stores, when produce and things were becoming scarce and there was a, a major shortage in the food. Uh, our CSA bags uh, really picked up at that time and, and participation and really picked up. Prior to that, people were not that interested. They, they were interested, but they didn't participate that much. But as uh, COVID hit, and they began to understand that the importance of nutritional food, uh, helping them to be able to overcome those symptoms and, and the issues of, of that virus, um, it really promoted our program. Um, as we said, we, we utilized our, our web and, and social media. Uh, our website is LegacyTasteOfTheGarden.com. Uh, uh, we have social media, um, Facebook and Instagram, uh, just used to hashtag legacy taste of the garden and our email is legacy taste of the garden at gmail.com. Uh, we, we, uh, had, had some serious issues that we ran into and that was basically due to COVID. And so part of our thing was to work with the people in the community to help to solve the issues of, uh, food deserts and to connect the farmers local growing with those communities. Uh, part of the key points that we did was to identify uh, what the community needs were and uh, what the issues and the effects of, of it was and to identify community leaders who are already involved in those communities. Um, we have people here in Bloomington and in, up in Gary, Indiana, because as our stuff began to grow, so did our uh, expansion. Uh, we, we, uh, empowered these leaders to be able to uh, tell us what they needed in their community and opposed to us coming in telling them what they needed. And so uh, in the upper left, uh, I think we did over 400 CSA bags. Um, those are all the yellow bags that you see on the floor. Uh, and that was in Evansville. In the middle there is uh, Chicago, uh, where we went up there and helped them to do a community garden. And uh, 
to the far right, that's uh, uh, another picture of, of um, the Indianapolis group that we dealt with there, uh, where we had the um, bucket uh, irrigation growing. Um, out of this, like I said, when COVID hit, uh, people really started to demand fresh produce. And out of that, we uh, provided in over eight cities, um, truckloads, semi-truckloads of fresh produce into those communities and really got the communities involved with that. Uh, so we, as we said, we're, we're trying to connect to meet the needs of the community and not just our ideals and thoughts. Um, also out of that, uh, we began to partner with these different communities and we created what we call Indiana Black Loam. Loam is uh, the, the best type of soil that you can get. There's three types of soil, clay, sand, and loam. Loam is your top soil, your most fertile soil. The darker it is, the better it is. And so our thing was cultivating a sustainable farm legacy and creating an opportunity that promotes the best growth for our farmers and communities. And so we ended up having uh, out of this, uh, through the connections that we made through this project, uh, uh, connecting with, with growers in Indianapolis, Bloomington, Gary, Fort Wayne, and Evansville, Indiana, uh, to promote these uh, programs. Uh, we have grown even more uh, in partnerships where we uh, connect with the uh, National Black Farmers Association. Uh, we partner with the NRCS of the USDA uh, and by her school in Indianapolis, as well as uh, local organizations, churches, uh, hospitals, Mount Carmel, New Destiny Church, Flanner House and Cleo's Bodega in, uh, in Indianapolis and in Cobra, um, I -Y, I -I -Y -E, uh, Youth and uh, is established in, uh, in Evansville uh, are some of the ones that we partner with. Um, out of that, uh, we uh, just kind of grew and, and grew into different projects. As I said, the, uh, uh, the grant that we had was the uh, uh, 2019 SARE grant. Uh, my son also uh, got a grant from the 2020 Hoosier Young Farmers Coalition. Uh, we were also awarded uh, two uh, 2501 grants uh, for the Legacy Farming and Health, which we call the Life Project. Uh, and that's with uh, Purdue Extension with the AgriAbility um, Project there and uh, with farmers across the nation. And Life stood for Legacy, Innovation, Farming, and Economics. And so um, those were the uh, things that we, uh, that we did uh, that stemmed out of this grant. Uh, this wasn't where we had planned to go to begin with. Uh, our, our main concept uh, uh, was to just collaborate with, with farmers and to use uh, unique practices to educate, produce, and provide a system that would increase the availability of, of whole food and uh, to get it to be used more in food deserts. And out of all that, this is where we're at today. And so um, it was due to the SARE grant that we have gotten to, to the point to where we are today. Um, and I don't think we would have been able to do it without it. I'm struck by like a lot of things in your, just how, you know, how you kind of streamlined and really connected agriculture and education across generations. I'm, I'm from Indianapolis, so I wasn't born uh, down here. This is where my wife and, and her family are from. Um, but it, it shocked me how um, most of the uh, communities that were considered food deserts were um, in, in the uh, black and brown communities. And that the farmers who had the least amount of uh, income revenue, productivity were black and brown farmers. And I'm like, where is the disconnect with that? Um, and so we were, and we, and the fact that we were losing a lot of our uh, farms from African American farmers uh, was, was became a great uh, concern of mine. And so, in trying to connect the two, I always ask questions. Um, you know, and and the more questions I ask, the more questions I 
figure I need to ask. And so part of the, the issues that I was finding when we first started this progress process, and as I said, at first people didn't want to be a part of the CSA program. They didn't understand why they needed to buy fresh produce and stuff. And I was trying to, to share with them the importance of having nutrition uh, in their body and that fresh produce brings that type of nutrition. In our community, we have what is called soul food. And as I broke it down to them, I said, everybody loves soul food. And so, but we have to understand what is soul food. And soul food was the fact that they would cook things that were fresh out of the garden, fresh uh, eggs, fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff. And you had all the fresh herbs and spices. And that's what gave it all that love and flavor that we enjoy. Now we have chemical substitutes. And so, but the problem with the chemical substitutes is that they don't provide the nutrition. Um, and so when you, when I began to do the research and I noticed that uh, 90, over 95% of all the diseases that we have, heart disease, high blood pressure, obesity, um, uh, what we call in our community, sugar, diabetes, um, things of that nature would all stem from food that we, you could, you could cure all of that just by eating the correct food. And so that's when I began to try to connect that back to the community and say, hey, these are the issues that we have in our community. Um, it still kind of fell on deaf ears, but when COVID hit and I started to help to connect that, what is the, the reason why COVID was so devastating in our communities was due to the fact that we had these pre-existing issues. Where did these pre-existing come from? Due to not eating the proper foods that were needed. And so with that being said, they began to make that connection. And so since COVID, uh, in the African-American community, not sure if it still is, but I, I heard about a year ago that they were begin becoming the fastest growing uh, plant-based uh, group in America uh, as far as, as converting over to plant-based food. And so I think that the word is, has gotten out a little bit and people are beginning to understand the difference in that. And so it's just in finding out what the disconnect is and trying to educate people so that they can make that connection with it. I, really, I wanted to ask you, John, too, like what questions are at the front of your mind, like um, heading into 2023? You know, I'm, I'm really asking uh, the community to really uh, come together. Um, you know, this is something I believe that uh, not just in our community, but in our nation that we need to do. Uh, we need to come to the mindset of, of the United States of America opposed to the divided states of America. Not trying to get on any political thing, but uh, if COVID showed us anything, it should have showed us how vulnerable we are uh, in our uh, dependence on other countries to feed us. Uh, and we, we should have enough food here to grow, uh, that's grown that to feed our communities. And so, we need to get back into the concept of making sure that we support our local growers, our local farmers, um, that we, you know, there's opportunities for individuals to be able to make their own local um, sauces or value-added products and stuff uh, and support one another. And so um, if we could do anything, if I could ask the community to do anything, that would be the thing that I would ask, support well, John, thank you for being so generous with your time and just your willingness to share and what kind of group has grown out of that sharing for many generations and just wishing you well and hopefully for for the next thousand generations to come, you know. <laughs> just want to thank you guys and to share. And, you know, this is, uh, I, I don't know how successful it is to anybody else, but it was more than successful for me. 